Now let us discuss the next topic that is skeletal muscle relaxants. So those drugs which can produce relaxation of skeletal muscles. So they can be classified in broad terms like peripherally acting skeletal muscle relaxants or which are directly acting on the skeletal muscles or which are centrally acting and producing skeletal muscle relaxation. The outcome, outcome of this skeletal muscle relaxation is different. If you see peripherally acting, they are purely neuromuscular blockages. That means they block the neuromuscular junction and they are purely skeletal muscle relaxants. They relax the muscle up to a level of paralysis. While directly acting and centrally acting skeletal muscle relaxants, they will not produce paralysis, but they will relieve the spasm due to excessive skeletal muscle contraction and they are usually known as spasmolytic. Let us see what is the difference between a pure skeletal muscle relaxant and a spasmolytic. So spasmolytic and skeletal muscle relaxant. The spasmolytic, they are usually drugs which act either centrally, that is at the level of spinal cord or directly on the skeletal muscles to relieve the spasm. While neuromuscular blockages or skeletal muscle relaxants, what we call, they are purely NM receptor antagonists. Kindly refer back NM receptor, nicotinic receptor, which is located in the skeletal muscle end plate, a cholinergic receptor, which is responsible for producing skeletal muscle contraction in response to the release of acetylcholine. Or acetylcholine will act on NM receptors on the skeletal muscle end plate and produce skeletal muscle contraction. So if the NM receptor is blocked, acetylcholine will no, will no longer will be able to produce uh, the contraction of skeletal muscles or even no, no, no longer will be able to maintain the normal tone of the skeletal muscles. So spasmolytic, they make the hypertonic skeletal muscle back to a normal tone. The spasm is due to the disorganized or excessive contraction of muscles. So the excessive contraction is due to hypertonicity and the hypertonicity can be brought back to a normal tone and muscle behaves like a normal one without excessive contraction. While skeletal muscle relaxants, they bring about the skeletal muscle tone to zero or nil. So that means the complete tone of the muscle is lost and the skeletal muscle is no longer able to perform the normal functions too. Like if you see the neck muscles, they are tonically contracted. That's why our head is upright. We are able to maintain a posture. We are able to stand up. We are able to continue standing because the, some many of the skeletal muscles are tonically contracted. But when skeletal muscle relaxants are given, entire tone of the muscle is lost and it can lead to paralysis of skeletal muscle. Spasmolytic, they never produce paralysis, but skeletal muscle relaxant causes complete paralysis of skeletal muscles. Coming to the uses, spasmolytic, they are mainly used in the spastic conditions associated with the spinal cord injury or cerebral palsies. While skeletal muscle relaxant, they are mainly used in pre-anesthetic medication, medication given before anesthesia or in surgeries to facilitate the surgical procedures. Coming to classification, first is skeletal muscle relaxant or neuromuscular blockers or known as NM receptor blocker or antagonist. Know the term NM receptor antagonist. Blocks the NM receptor and prevents the action of acetylcholine through the NM receptors. Subclassification, competitive or non-depolarizing blockers. So competitive, they compete with acetylcholine. Non-depolarizing blocker, I'll come to that what it is. The next uh, point. Example, d or pancuronium, which are long-acting drugs. Second, vicuronium, rocuronium, atracurium, intermediate acting. Atracurium, kindly refer back, is a drug which shows Hoffman elimination. A rare type of biotransformation, refer back. Mevacurium, it's a short-acting drug, useful in case of intubation procedures, because it's a short-acting, useful for very short procedures. Second depolarizing blocker, that makes the difference. The first one was non-depolarizing blocker and second one is depolarizing blocker. These are drugs which can activate NM receptors, but it continues to activate without a halt. And the continuous activation of the receptors finally lead to the desensitization of the receptors 
leading to loss of activity of the receptor and skeletal muscle relaxation. Example, succinyl colic. It also spells somewhat similar like acetyl colic. So they can bind to the acetyl colic receptor, that is NM receptor, activate it, but it is not removed because there is no enzyme available to remove succinyl colic from the snaps. So it continues to activate the NM receptor and finally the NM receptor will become desensitized. That means the receptor will no longer respond to any of the stimuli. Second is decamethonia. Centrally acting skeletal muscle relaxants. Classical example diazepam, baclofen, chlorsoxazone and theocolchicoside. All of these drugs act at the level of spinal cord and they mainly act by facilitating GABA mediated inhibitory neurotransmission. GABA, G-A-B-A gamma amino butyric acid mediated inhibitory neurotransmission at the level of spinal cord directly acting that's directly act on the skeletal muscle only one drug that is dandroin sodium the first is competitive or non depolarizing blocker mechanism of action as i mentioned it is a pure nm receptor antagonist so it competes with acetylcholine for the nm receptors in the skeletal muscle end plate and block NM receptor hence leading to lack of response of NM receptor to the constrictor stimuli that is to the acetylcholine leading to skeletal muscle paralysis. While depolarizing blocker it's a two steps of action first step it produces depolarization that is persistent depolarization or continuous depolarization that is a phase one it combined with the nicotinic receptor that is NM receptor and depolarized motor interplate and because of that depolarization initially it produces skeletal muscle contraction but it is disorganized skeletal muscle contraction resulting in muscle fasciculation or twitching and the persistent depolarization will continue since acetylcholine esterase is not able to remove succinylcholine from the snaps and this phase two second phase is a desensitization block because of persistent continuous depolarization of NM receptor the NM receptor will finally fail to respond to any of the stimuli like what happens in a excessive voltage comes in a uh, electric line but called short circuit somewhat like that so once short circuit comes and their line fails and no current supply so somewhat like that so continuous exposure to succinylcholine will lead to desensitization of the NM receptor leading to paralysis of skeletal muscle so let us see what's the difference between these two classes so competitive is pure NM receptor antagonist while depolarizing is an NM receptor agonist and competitive blocker it causes flaccid paralysis nothing but without producing contraction directly the muscle go to a stage of paralysis relaxation and paralysis but depolarizing blocker initially produces fasciculation or disorganized contraction of skeletal muscle followed by paralysis what we call spastic paralysis competitive blocker the muscles affect at low doses that means very low doses it can selectively relax some of the muscles especially the muscles of eye that is extra ocular muscles so that's the reason why it is highly useful for ocular surgeries while depolarizing block at low doses they mainly relaxes the muscles of neck jaw pharynx as well as the trunk so that makes it more useful in case of endotracheal intubation procedures and all competitive blocker they causes release of histamine both of them do the same thing so it should be both of them should be better to avoid during uh, uh, in case of patients with the asthma competitive blocker they can produce significant fall in bp the first reason is reduced the venous return because of skeletal muscle paralysis the blood flow from the legs back to the heart will be reduced second ganglionic blockade and histamine release both will produce again vasodilatation leading to fall in bp while depolarizing blocker they can cause cardiac arrhythmia the reason is stimulation of sympathetic ganglia because it is a agonist it can also stimulate the nn receptor located in the autonomic ganglia Coming to the next difference, there is no hyperkalemia associated with a competitive blocker but depolarizing blocker there is a risk of hyperkalemia and associated cardiac arrest on overdosage. As I mentioned competitive blocker they are useful for ocular surgeries while depolarizing blocker should be avoided during ocular surgeries because it can increase intraocular pressure. So 
so that has to be avoided and also also in patients with the glaucoma this drug has to be avoided the competitive blocker they can cause post operative paralysis of ileum or even cause post operative urinary retention so that has to be urinary retention not a matter but ileum will be paralytic refer back neostigmin is a drug which is used to overcome this particular state while depolarizing blocker it increases intragastric pressure which can lead to regurgitation of the gastric content in the esophagus which can be fatal in case of anesthesia next difference apnea is very much common with the competitive or non depolarizing blocker because of paralysis of respiratory muscles like diaphragm intercostal internal and external intercostal muscles while in case of depolarizing blocker it is observed only in some patients that is the patients with the genetic variability that is patients with the presence of atypical pseudopolyesterases where the patient is now the, uh, the patient is not able to metabolize the drug at a faster rate due to the lack of the usual pseudopolyesterase refer back it is mentioned under factors modifying drug action kindly refer it so these are some uses of uh, the skeletal muscle relaxation as i mentioned in the competitive blocker neuromuscular blockers they are mainly used for thoracic abdominal surgeries intubation procedures and endoscopies the preferred is mevacuria orthopedic procedures severe cases of tetanus and status epilepticus where muscle tone will be very high pre anesthetic medication to produce or to supplement skeletal muscle relaxation while succinylcholine or mevacuria why i mention mevacuria here because it is a short acting drug succinylcholine is also a short acting drug so they are mainly used for brief procedures or procedures which are short lasting like endotracheal intubation laryngoscopy bronchoscopy esophagoscopy etc correction of fracture and dislocation to avoid convulsions or trauma associated with the electro convulsive therapy So this figure shows the presence of a uh, receptor. This is a rare, rare type of receptor, never mentioned anywhere. Rhinodyne receptor. This is a receptor which is located in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the activation of this receptor, rhinodyne receptor, in response to depolarization of the skeletal muscle fibers, it will cause the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And uh, as you studied, calcium is required for excitation, contraction, coupling. followed by skeletal muscle contraction so if the rhinodyne receptor is blocked the calcium will not be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum as a result there won't be skeletal muscle contraction in response to the stimuli so just see the drug it's a dantrolin sodium directly acting skeletal muscle relaxant it inhibits calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and skeletal muscle the reason is it inhibits rhinodyne receptor It inhibits rhinodyne receptor in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and inhibit excitation contraction coupling in the muscle fiber. And they are mainly used for malignant hyperthermia and spastic conditions associated with the spinal cord injury or cerebral palsy. So malignant hyperthermia, it is a condition which there will be a rise in body temperature. There is a sudden rise in body temperature, and the reason for sorry. and the reason for is increased release of calcium and intense muscle spasm and if the rhinodyne receptor can be blocked the release of calcium can be prevented as a result intense muscle spasm will be prevented and rise in body temperature can be also prevented so dantrolin sodium is highly useful in treating malignant hypothermia coming to centrally acting skeletal muscle relaxant they mainly act at the level of spinal cord and they promote the GABA mediated inhibitory neurotransmission you can see here GABA GABA mediated inhibitory neurotransmission so spasmolytic baclofen diazepa already mentioned prosoxone or um, theocolchicoside all act by facilitating GABA mediated inhibitory neurotransmission and they are mainly used for spinal cord injury sorry spinal cord injury stroke cerebral palsy etc they are used as spasmolytic to reduce or prevent the spasm or relieve the muscle spasm associated with the spinal cord injury stroke and cerebral palsy don't mention it is used for spinal cord injury stroke and cerebral palsy it is used to relieve muscle spasm associated with the spinal cord injury stroke and cerebral palsy coming to the last topic <coughs> drugs acting on autonomic ganglia 
There are two types of drugs which can stimulate the autonomic ganglia of both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. They are known as ganglionic stimulant which can stimulate and which can block. They are known as ganglionic blockage. We give more importance for the blockage. Example, pentolinium and trimethophen. I'll note down this drug trimethophen. It blocks NN receptor in the both the sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic ganglia and block both sympathetic as well as parasympathetic nervous system. So the outcome of action will depend upon which nervous system supplies predominantly to a particular organ. If you see the classical example heart, the parasympathetic nervous system is the main innervation. So ganglionic blockade will tend to decrease the parasympathetic activity in the heart. As a result, the outcome will be similar to anticholinergic effect that will be increased in heart rate. Well, if you see in case of blood vessels, the blood vessels, the tone is mainly maintained by the sympathetic nervous system. So blockade of autonomic ganglia will produce an action similar to the blockade of sympathetic activity leading to vasodilatation. So the action will depend upon which nervous system predominantly supply or control the action of a particular organ. So that's a outcome of a ganglionic blocker. Thank you very much.